Ronde. From Boca Raton, Florida, Rabbis Ephraim Goldberg, Philip Moskowitz, and Josh Brody are taking you behind the Bema. The BRS rabbis schmooze about contemporary issues and talk to special guests who give a behind-the-scenes look at how they got to where they are and what keeps them going. Welcome to Behind the Bema. It is Wednesday night, 9 p.m. I am your host, Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg, joined by my dear friends and colleagues, Rabbi Philip Moskowitz and Rabbi Joshua Brody, and we're here to take you behind the Bema. We're here to take you behind the beam, but that is right. Rabbi Josh Brody is back. He's back. He's gone. He's back. He's gone. <laughs> but the three of us are back together again. I'm so grateful that you are here with us as well. We have a phenomenal guest tonight, Jamie Geller, a celebrity chef, an influencer, someone with a remarkable life story, someone who's now changing the world as the chief marketing and media officer of Aish, doing great things, and we're going to have a great, great conversation. But we start, as we always do, with gratitude to our generous sponsor. Sponsor is someone familiar to BRS. We've been working together for a long time, and that is Gilly's Goodies. Gilly's Love Goodies him. is the best way to spend send a sweet hug to your family and friends in Israel for Hanukkah. Hanukkah is coming up. Maybe you have family there. Maybe you've got a kid studying in Israel for the year. Maybe you've got a Rebbe, a teacher. Maybe you have someone who's made Aliyah. Since 2001, Gilly's Goodies has delivered tens of thousands of gift baskets, occasions, birthdays, bar and bat mitzvahs, births. In addition, they have a special Behind the Bema listener. So if you're a Behind the Bema listener, and you are, if you're hearing me say that right now, 10% off your order. Hanukkah's Whoa. coming up. Whoa, 10% off your Hang order. Hang on, I got to go make an order right now. Hanukkah's coming up, and you've got someone in Israel who you need to send something to. So this is offers available through th- Thanksgiving, November 25th. Coupon code is BIMA, B-I-M-A, BIMA. Anyone who places an order with the coupon code will get entered in a drawing for a free basket worth up to $75. You can enter by emailing david at gilliesgoodies.com. Subject line, BEMA to enter. Get david at gilliesgoodies.com. Big thank you to our friends at Gillies Goodies for sponsoring tonight. Gentlemen, how was your week? How are you? Week was phenomenal. Uh, you know, we always talk about like rabbinic transitions, going from one program to another very quickly and transferring or, tra- you know, transforming emotions. We just came from a very powerful program that I know we're going to get to in a little bit. But uh, tomorrow is Veterans Day, and we at BRS ran a very special program this year to be able to honor and to celebrate and to commemorate the veterans in our community. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but I'm still a little uh, shaken from that experience of just the speeches that we heard and the words that we heard. Very powerful experience. That was a tremendous program. I, too, have a headache from literally crying because it was so emotional and impactful. We'll get to that in one second. But before we do, this program... So many people who do not have the second meaningful part of a program, it began with a barbecue, like so many other observances of American oh, no. special days. Oh, so no. I'm online at the buffet. I'm online at the smorg. A little let's chat and one, cut. One of the, a little chat and cut. But one of the three of us is a vegan. So let's just say we come off the buffet with our plates. And I've got you know a clean, neat chicken cutlet, a hamburger, no bun, no roll, no carb, nothing fattening. And what else did I have? I had a few a few delicious proteins. Poppers, yeah, the poppers, then, the steak and then bites. I'm standing next to and sitting opposite my dear friend Josh Brody, Rabbi Josh Brody, who's a vegan, who lectures about good health and vegan as opposed to eating unhealthy. And I look at over his plate and he's eating fried rice and French fries. Because if you're a vegan at a barbecue, all that's Nothing left. I noticed he didn't have the salad. So I just, what, what's the, you're a vegan, but like you can't tell me your mayonnaise. plate was healthier than mine. Chicken yeah. cutlet. Clean chicken cutlet versus a plate of French fries and fried rice. It's Michigan. Vegan, defend yourself. No, there's no way to defend myself. It's just like I'm trying to <laughs> find food to eat because I got nothing. I got nothing to eat. Like it's either that or I'm going to starve. Yeah, I was at but a there wedding. There's no on good Sunday. defense. It's not. It's not. I was at a wedding on Sunday, and uh, I was at the carving station waiting for a piece of protein, delicious, right. healthy protein piece of meat. And a dear friend, a person in a prominent position, walks up. Another prominent vegan who spoke about it when we interviewed him on Behind the Bima with his wife and he's got a plate full of fried onion rings <laughs> if you're a vegan you're looking what to eat i'm like there's no way <laughs> look at my plate of cut meat and you've got your <sighs> fried onion rings all right that is the unimportant no, i'm just saying it was either that or the only other thing i could have eaten when there was the pickles i was just like i'm just not gonna eat pickles for dinner pickles for dinner instead you have french fries <laughs> fried rice and yet somehow you feel you are you know more yeah. healthy than the pure no, I, protein. I can't tell you right now, I do not feel healthy after a dinner like that. I feel <laughs> yeah. sick. 
quick uh, before we get to our Veterans Day program and welcome our celebrity chef, our celebrity influencer guest, the one and only Jamie Geller. Big shout out and thank you to Alana Lando, who continues to on her own creatively think, made these beautiful behind the beam of pads. Stay happy, stay healthy, stay holy on the bottom behind the beam, each one with our name, so you can get a little note from us. Grateful yeah. for that, continuing to do for us. Our sponsors are amazing. Alana's doing great things for us. Julie Ehrlich helped do our wedding today. The goodness of her heart. We had a small wedding at the shul in the middle of the day. Uh, people that don't even live here, just a, a beautiful kindness. And she helped put that together. Julie's an amazing party planner. Grateful to all of our sponsors and too many to name, but really have done great things, continue to do great things. And we're so appreciative of them. Um, we were at a bris earlier this week. It's a little catch up behind the Bima, going behind the Bima. The three of us were at a bris in Hollywood. And someone who'd never met us, but is a fan of Behind the Bima, walks over and says simultaneously, <laughs> I really enjoyed it, said, said, Rabbi Moskowitz, you're much taller than I thought. <laughs> Brody, you are much shorter than I thought. Because when we're on screen, we all no, like, can't, say, can't really tell. You can't right. really tell. And it was at the same like, bris where someone came over to me. I'm telling you, I've, I've known this person for 20 years. I've literally, I've seen them in shul many, many times. He comes over to me and he says, he says, you look very familiar. He couldn't figure it out. And then he comes over five and so he's like, oh, I, I don't I don't see you without the headphones. But but I've known this person <laughs> for 20 years, and it's like only now because of the show that the person recognizes me. <laughs> Amazing. So we came from this incredible program. Right. Veterans Day is tomorrow, as Rabbi Moskowitz said. I think that the Jewish community, maybe the observing community in particular, are, are a little uh, insensitive. We may not appreciate as much. We don't have as many, much contact with people who serve. We have we have members of our community, maybe members of our family who served in World War II or some wars of yesteryear a long time ago. We think about the Veterans Day, Memorial Day. Um, but in terms of touch points with people who've served more recently in, in this millennium, uh, we have a lot less. And, and therefore, maybe we're not as appreciative of the sacrifice, the enormous sacrifice that's made by our veterans uh, who lose friends, who are on the front lines, who experience and come back with PTSD, which is real trauma. They come back with, we learned a new term tonight, moral, what was it called? Moral injuries. Moral injury. When you're put in a position that you have to do something that violates your own morals, a 10-year-old po points an AK-47 at you, and you have no choice to defend your own life to pull the trigger. And uh, tonight we honored veterans. We had some of those right. veterans at Shul, and we had a program, Heroes to Heroes and JNF. Rabbi Moskowitz, tell us a little bit more about what are Heroes to Heroes and JNF? What was this program like? It was that, you know, I'll tell you, it was an extraordinary partnership. Um, Heroes to Heroes, JNF people know about, obviously, for their incredible work that they do in Israel. And there was actually a big reveal at the dinner tonight, which maybe we'll get to in a second. That's right. But one of the programs that JNF partially funds is this program called Heroes to Heroes, this amazing woman named Ju Judy Elias, um, where they basically take American veterans to Israel. And they provide spiritual healing for them in the land of Israel. The American soldiers interact with Israeli veterans, and they take them on a spiritual journey. So for people who saw some of the, the harshest traumas of their life, and they saw such, such misery and such death, and they lost hope in humanity, and it shattered their entire sense of faith. And then they bring them to Israel, where they meet Israeli veterans, and they see the sights of the Holy Land, and they bask in the, the sanctity of the sights and the scenes. Um, and it restores their faith in humanity, and they're able to come back um, with a renewed mission um, of giving, of service to themselves, of recognizing a new calling for themselves, even after some of the difficulties they've been going through. And the stories we heard tonight are, are they're miraculous stories. They're people mm -hmm. who went to Israel broken and shattered, and they refound their faith in Israel and came back as new people. And it was, as you said, I was tearing up the entire time. Uh, very powerful speeches by people. I'll tell you the most, you know, one of the speeches we heard tonight was someone who served 30 years ago. Roberto, and to hear him yeah. describe with such vivid um, imagery, and, and you can almost see him like replaying the situations in his, in his mind 30 years later to still be experiencing the trauma and to be able to find that level of healing in our beloved state of Israel through a program called Heroes to Heroes, JNF Partnership. It was such an honor, such a point of pride for us to be able to host it in our show tonight. Yeah, it really was. And to hear him that Heroes to Heroes saved his life, saved his family. Also, it was a very somber night because someone very close to our community, a non-Jewish family, but a tennis instructor that many of our families have interacted with, whose son valiantly fought and came back with a lot of demons and overcame several attempted suicides. Heroes to Heroes healed him. He came back. He was a leader. And unfortunately, lost lost that battle. And uh, when when we had a Heroes to Hero event several years ago, uh, Andrew Snow spoke at it, 
And right. uh, tonight, instead, we spoke about him, and that was a real loss. It's it's very real. It's real. So tomorrow, you know, just as they have off from school or work or barbecue or shop or catch a sporting event, there are veterans and find a way to express that gratitude, that appreciation for the sacrifices they make. That is not something which is competing with our Torah or Jewish values. It is completely consistent with it. And it's our responsibility to be able to show that. Rabbi Moskowitz, you mentioned that we unveiled something tonight uh, several months ago when rockets rained down our brothers and sisters in Israel. And we had on Yadid Yaharush, the Chalutza community. And they were running into bomb shelters over and over again. We did something we had never done before. We're not going to necessarily do so quickly again. But we raised money through Behind the Bima and uh, we painted a bomb shelter. We're really excited to show it to you tonight. Here is outside of Sterot in uh, in the Gaza uh, envelope, envelope outside envelope. of the area where the rockets are raining down, have rained down. We hope and pray they never rain down again. But here is this beautiful Behind the Bima bomb shelter. And it's thanks to you, our listeners. Thanks to you, our audience who uh, answered the call. We raised the money that night in the one show. And this is a beautiful bomb shelter. Uh, there's other beautiful images with it. And uh, we're, we're certainly very uh, proud and very grateful to be able to have been a little bit of a part of that. So that's something really great. Any Rabbi Brody, any impressions on tonight's program? Anything stand out to you? That's great. I'm sure tomorrow when we go shop, you go to the you know Publix or you go to the supermarkets, you're going to see a lot of you know older folks wearing those uh, veterans Hats. I saw one today, a guy, you know, it said Vietnam on it. And just make sure when you go over and you see someone wearing a hat, it's not that they bought it in, you know, in the store. These are, these are real veterans. We should make a, right. make it a point tomorrow just to say thank you for their service. Yeah, and exactly. I don't know why a lot, I mean, growing up, I, I never saw programs like this. I mean, I, there, I, I don't remember back in uh, New Jersey doing veterans day programs. I think it's so important. I think we should do more of these. That's things. what I said. I think a lot of times, you know, our community, whatever that means, because we talked right. last week about who are we right. and, you know, who's the show for, but our community, whatever that means, not, not necessarily so in touch and so connected. And um, I think it's more, it's important. It's a Kiddush Hashem. It's gratitude. These are core Jewish Torah values. It's important for us to show them. We have been calling upon you the last several weeks to rate and review our show on Apple Podcasts and to be entered into a raffle for great Behind the Beam of Swag. Last week's winner, the raffle of the great comment, the great uh, review of last week comes from Lauren Horowitz who writes, the highlight of my Thursday night pre-Shabbos cooking is listening to this fantastic podcast. The guests and hosts are phenomenal, always provide inspiration and comfort to me each time I listen. Plus, I love getting to feel like I'm part of the BRS community, even though I'm stuck in New York. Her words, not ours, even though I'm stuck. So Lauren Horowitz needs to be redeemed from New York. So if you can, she is stuck in New York. But Lauren, thank you for that kind review. We're going to send you that BRS swag. Get us your contact information so you know where to send it. And as always, rate and review. Not because of us, Jamie Geller. Jamie Geller is a fantastic person. She has done and is doing great things. And we want more and more people to be able to hear and draw from her inspiration and how fantastic she is. And so please help us by rating and reviewing. Jamie Geller, most of you know, a lot of you have tuned in to hear her tonight. Uh, She is now Israeli, moved to Israel, but American-born, food writer, celebrity chef. She's written several cookbooks. She's the founder of the Koshia Media Network. She launched Joy of Kosher with Jamie Geller. She used to be a... um, uh, television producer for CNN, Entertainment News, Food Network, HBO, and others. And she found her journey back to Torah Judaism and uh, now is living in Beit Shemesh in Israel, works for Aish, this change in the world. She is a fantastic person and a great influencer, and we are so excited to bring her to you tonight. Without any further ado, it's such a privilege to welcome Jamie Geller. What a great joy. How exciting it is to welcome the great Jamie Geller to Behind the Bima. Thank you for making some time to go Behind the Bima with us. It's my pleasure. This is so exciting and such an important and big show to be on. After Cheryl Sandberg was on, I feel like, you know, everyone's knocking down your doors. No question. They're knocking down <laughs> our doors, but you know what? They have to wait in line. Everyone have to be patient. We'll get them on when we can, but we're so excited <laughs> to have this conversation with you, Jamie. Your life story is so inspiring and uh, your passions, what you're excited about for me personally, I share the same excitement. You love Judaism and you love food. And I love Judaism and I love food. So we have so much. Right, I'm one about. for two, guys. I'm one for two. Rabbi Moskowitz loves Judaism on the food. On the food, not so much. Like we had Beatty Deutsch on and he was able to talk to her about running. And I was kind of sidelined. So, so tonight we'll talk about we'll talk about Judaism. We'll talk about food. So Jamie, you have an amazing life story. Um, you were really somebody who was exploding in terms of uh, career opportunities. You were a television producer, CNN, Entertainment News, Food Network, uh, writing for HBO. And what pivoted? What was the change? What was the turning point that took you into the life? You probably never then imagined you'd be living in Israel, a leader at Aish, helping transform and inspire the Jewish world. What happened? Tell us about it. 
Never. Um, basically, I always say my mom wanted me to marry a nice Jewish guy. So she sent me to like these like Jewish singles events. And she didn't think I was going to find, you know, my shirt um, at the after party of the Academy Awards. She, well, she was very nervous that I would find the wrong one there. So she sent me to these single scene, um, these like tour classes. Uh, Rebbitton Esther Young Rice, she should, you know, rest in peace. She had a wonderful um, um, Upper West Side Hineni. Uh, I went to events there. I found myself at Ace New York. And, uh, and I got really started to become interested in Judaism and um, what it had to offer. And I was exposed to it. It was presented to me for the first time in a way that was relevant to my life. You know, I always thought like, okay, this is my life. This is my career. These are my aspirations. And then Judaism is like something I like or don't like. It's on the side. You take it or leave it. You pick it up for the holidays. You pick it up for a milestone. But I never thought it could be truly integrated into my, day, my everyday life and that it would be relevant. And that's what I learned at like, you know, East New York and all these other um, places. And so that was the beginning of the end or the beginning of the beginning. <laughs> the beginning of the beginning. So I guess my question for you is, you know, a lot of people read that resume, that bio, and they think that's really glamorous. That's what they dream of to be a, an executive at HBO, to be writing and producing for CNN Entertainment News Food Network. Um, when you began to become more, began to become more observant, was it incompatible? Can somebody live an observant life and still be an executive in the entertainment industry? Did you happen to transition away or was it because being observant was incompatible with that life? That's such an amazing question. Um, at least initially, I thought I wanted to have my cake and eat it too. And I thought like, I can, I can do this and that, and I can keep Shabbos and I can, you know, be on a live show on the red carpet on, you know, Sunday morning or Saturday night, let's say Shabbos. But I really, as I started to grow a lot more in my religious journey, I became a lot more sensitive to some of the things that I was dealing with, some of the subject matters. I decided I did not want to have a TV in my own home. TVs now, they're like, so, you know, last century. But, you know, I, I wanted to um, separate myself a little bit more from sort of the everyday influences of culture and pop culture. So for me personally, it wasn't compatible. compatible. But I see that now and today, and even, even now what I do in my everyday life, even in the capacity of age, I do see a lot more integration able to take place. And I see a lot more successful people who are living their successful career dreams, um, but at the same time wearing their Judaism very, very proudly and very loudly, but like in, a, in a, an elegant way, of course. I don't mean shouting it out. And I do see a lot of opportunity for overlap and compatibility if that is what you want. That's a very important message. In other words, it's not, it's not either or. The people listening Correct. who say, I crave or I want to break into that industry, I'll have to walk away from Yiddishkeit. It's either or. It doesn't have to be either or, and you can make the best of both and integrate as best you can. I do not only that, but I actually think that um, if you're, you take your Judaism seriously and you learn a lot about it and you can integrate that into whatever career path that you choose or whatever feeds your creative soul, you have an opportunity to excel in a way that no one else does. You have this like edge. You're talking about talking to BD, you know, like you have an advantage here. You know, if we could really integrate um, what Judaism teaches us about life and morals and values and ethics and business and how to comport ourselves and wh what our mission is in the world, it it's an advantage. Absolutely. So don't be shy or defensive or apologetic. Actually bring it to right. what we're doing and make that difference. Rabbi Moskowitz, we'll get you in in one second. Let me ask one more. And that is uh, in your bio, or at least uh, on some of the pages that have your bio, you mentioned you didn't even know how to cook before you got married and that you, quote, learned out of necessity. So here's the question yeah. for you. Why is it a necessity to cook? Is it that being married was the necessity that you had to cook the expectation? <laughs> Could your husband not? Could you not pick up takeout or, or delivery? Um, is it being orthodox created the necessity because so much of an observant way of life revolves around food? In that quote that it was out of necessity that you learned to cook, what was the driver of that, of that necessity? I do definitely think it was an orthodox way of life. So much of... Um, the family uh, time connections and experiences happen around the table and around the holidays and around the weekly, you know, Shabbos meals. And so that to me was the driving force of, you know, wanting to entertain and wanting to be a, an active part in getting that food on the table. Obviously, we could totally do takeout. And I'm totally a fan of that. If that's good for anyone, it's good, you know, for you. But it's important that we get around the table together. But that to me was the driving force in terms of necessity. Um, but by the way, my husband knew how to cook. He taught me how to cook. I was the bride who knew nothing. So in theory, I could just you know, coast along here, let him do his thing all on his own. I figured, let me help him out too. Let's make this an equal opportunity household in the kitchen. And that became your career to pivot to it, Rabbi. Crazy, yeah. I got a lot of questions of that because I'm going to have to ask you about some advice for me and Rabbi Goldberg as we are budding <laughs> uh, chefs in the kitchen. But before I get to that, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned 
that uh, as you became more religious, you became more protective of the influences that came into your house, how you were reticent to have a TV and, and such things. And yet, you've obviously wholly embraced social media as a platform to do enormous good in the Jewish world. And now you're using it at Aish specifically as a driving force for bringing Torah into everyone's homes. Um, what gave you that foresight that social media in particular could be used as such a vehicle to be able to bring so much good into so many religious homes? Do you have any qualms about that? In other words, are there any things about the social media platforms that make you nervous? Um, if you could just speak about the role social media has played in kind of the evolution, both within the, the cooking realm, within the realm of Aish, in terms of bringing Torah to so many people. Um, yeah, I don't want to say that I had foresight. I don't want to pat myself on the back. I happen to just be at the right place at the right time. A lot of times with social media and as platforms, you know, emerge and, you know, we saw Snapchat, we saw TikTok. Now Twitch is a gaming platform that's, you know, coming out. If you're there first, you're an early adopter. A lot of times that's your creative advantage. That's your edge. And that gives you a lot of, you know, opportunities. So when I started first, I always say you could take the TV, the girl, you know, out of New York and you could take the girl out of TV, but you can't take the TV producer out of the girl. And so even though I got rid of the TV and I got rid of my job at HBO and CNN and Food Network and everything, once I started this career in food and cookbooks and marketing, and I started to travel all over the world, meeting people, doing cooking demos, telling my story, I realized the scalability from, an, from a business perspective of me raising a family, having children, having a growing young family, and traveling all over the world to spread the message of what I wanted to spread and to speak about what I, what I wanted to speak about was just, it was, it was unattainable. It was uh, impossible uh, in terms of manageability and scalability. So that's when Facebook is like, oh, maybe you should have a Facebook page, you know, like Facebook, let's start a blog, let's start a website. Oh, this Instagram thing happened, you know, the next thing you know, you're on Twitter and, and you know, TikTok and everywhere. So it, it was like I had a lot of early adapter opportunities to give that edge. And then once I was there, once I was in it and I saw the power of it, um, it is definitely intoxicating. It's definitely addictive. Um, and what Rabbi Goldberg spoke about, he wrote about, and I was so captivated. We were all sharing that article that he wrote on the um, Jewish press, you know, on influencers, it, uh, on influencing. I don't know if I'm going to say the title exactly right, but it was everything he said was so right. And we have to be so mindful of using it for the good because it has so much power. But like everything, there's, there's two sides to that coin. I think the rabbis probably speak to that more than I can. So, so what are some of the boundaries that we can have in terms of that? Because that was that article, and I, I really appreciated our exchange about that. And thank you for sharing those thoughts. And 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 it means a lot to me that it resonated for you, somebody who arguably is a great Jewish influencer and a great chef influencer, and so on and so forth. So, on the one hand, you're right. You know, these platforms and this influence that reach on kosher food, on modest clothing, on we're trying to bring those products and those services and those ideas to a broad audience, making them cool and with it and in, and people want to follow. That's enormous. On the other hand, are we attributing too much power? Meaning today, anyone with a with a camera and an internet connection can even in, in a very fraudulent way become an influencer, right? There's all yeah. kinds of research and there are all kinds of documentaries that have been done on people where you can buy followers and you can gain traction and hit a tipping point and people can become influencers and they are indeed influencing and they should not be a source of influence. So could you speak to that kind of, Rabbi Maskos was alluding to, but bridging your worlds in Aish and of your world online as an influencer, um, how can we, the consumer of social media, how can we be judicious and careful that we're only being influenced by people who should be influencing us? How do we make sure that we're continuing to be influenced on offline as much as online? Go find those righteous people. Go find those sources of wisdom and light and teaching and Torah and role models offline as much as online. That we don't disproportionately give too much of our time, attention, and too much of our excitement and celebrity uh, reaction to the online versus the offline. And to be judicious consumers of what's available online. Well, I, you just said so much, and there's so much to unpack. And as I love listening to you, I love reading your work. And um, first of all, I want to just make note, I don't know if you guys are following, but there is such a thing as meta humans and digital influencers. So there are actually influencers who are influencing millions. They have millions and millions of followers. They're not actually people. They're computer generated people. And their creators create them and create multiple. Like you can go to one of the top uh, meta human creators out there and you can see his library of people that he has created and they're each doing different things and they're you know whether they're in fashion whether they're in cooking whether they're in travel whether they're just you know 
um, lifestyle influencers in general, and whether black, white, you know, every every color, every shape, every version of everything, you know, they satisfy every criteria and every you know niche community, and they're out there influencing. And those are digital, and they're not even people. And you follow them, and they like people are invested in their lives, and they're not even real. So um, the whole thing, I think we have to be careful, but I don't think it's a new problem. Um, we had this issue when I was growing up with celebrity culture and celebrity influences. And it's like, why is the number one movie star or the number one basketball player suddenly the idol and the reference point for kids growing up? And how you like, and how does how do the parents and how does the person manage themselves and how do parents manage their kids being influenced by the wrong people just because they happen to be really good at basketball? What made them an icon for children and for, you know, and like for and the arbiter of what is cool? So um, I think that we have to be super vigilant as parents over our children. Um, I don't have my children to have no access to social media. Um, I know that that's not possible for everyone. Um, and I think that we have to be very careful as parents, what we give our kids access to, how much time we have them online, being mindful of what they're following. And even as, our, as ourselves, as adults, I think we could go down a rabbit hole. I spoke about it before. It's intoxicating and addictive for those who are influencing and for those who are being influenced. And it's created as such. I mean, we see all the documentaries, like you said. So step one is realizing the problem, right? Like I think he's always said, step one is recognizing it's out there. And then you can have your eyes open a little bit more to that. And you follow the people and the things that bring you joy and that bring you true, true joy, like that are good for your neshama, that are authentic. And be careful, mindful of not following, you know, for things that just bring like fleeting joy or entertainment or inspiration that's all um gashmias or like you know superficial rooted in superficiality i think there has to be an underlining um layer of um truth and spirituality to those that you are following if you that's a, you know that's a great point so, so here's the follow-up question to that so people are choosing who to follow what are the top three things they should look for they're on instagram let's say they're not your children they're people living in that world so they're choosing yeah. who to follow what are the criteria what, what boxes need to be checked for someone to say, follow, I'm going to follow that person. Okay. So first of all, if you feel any pangs of jealousy or comparison syndrome, that's not healthy. And that's, you don't follow because that, that's not bringing you. So that's number one. Um, number two is look for like authenticity. I feel like, you know, like you, you can, something smells or reeks of being real or being a little bit over too curated and too fabricated and too perfect. So often that's an, like an overcompensation for the fact that it's not. And I also personally don't like to follow people that live on social media. There's some people where you see they live their entire life that way. And if I feel like they're living, you spoke a lot about that, about the tourists and the tourons, like you're living not for the moment and not for the experience of the moment, but for capturing that moment and for, um, and for um, distributing, you know, producing, projecting that moment to everyone else. People who live like that and live for that, they're not really living life. And so those are the three things that I look for, you know. That's great. First of all, those are excellent pieces of advice. I want to follow up a different question. You had mentioned the intoxicating nature of being someone on the internet, someone who people are following. And, you know, me to a lesser extent, but Rabbi Goldberg as well, I know, speaks about this a lot. What are some boundaries you put in place for yourself? to make sure that you're always staying grounded, that you're always staying rooted, that as your followers grow internationally, you're staying true to who you are as a person and never letting it get to your head too much. Well, I don't think I have that problem. I, and nothing's never gotten like the opposite. Um, I, I, uh, I have a different problem. My problem is, you know, being a perfectionist and everything being amazing. So I never, I'm, I, I don't think, I hope I don't um, just, let things get to my head. I hope that no, I'm not suggesting I, that you do. Yeah. I'm suggesting for public people, people who are out there, people, you know, Rabbi Goldberg and I always talk about, you know, and he'll give a she or a Shabbat Shuvah Russia, and there are 10,000 people watching or he'll publish an article that goes viral. So we talk about how it's challenging as a very public person to, again, always stay grounded and true to who you are and to never lose sight of that as the numbers of your followers, people watching you, people reading you continue to grow. Well, I mean, I think that if you're doing something that that you believe in, that you feel is good for the world, and it's very mission driven, and especially you know someone like a rabbi who's who's giving a drasha, who has that kind of following, I think that you're spreading Torah, you're spreading light, you're spreading MS, you're spreading truth. 
And I don't think that it ever, I, I think that, that that's what grounds you. The fact that you're keeping your subject matter authentic and important and something that the world needs to hear, then it becomes a mission. Then it doesn't become all, all that other stuff around it, if I understood the question correctly. Mm -hmm. So, so you're living in Israel now. You made Aliyah with your family. What motivated that? You, you had been gaining success here, and you had a new career. You pivoted as a newly observant person. You left the world yeah. of entertainment, uh, the industry behind. Why, why did you move to Israel? And in Israel, talk to us about your role at Aish, Chief Media Marketing Officer. Aish is a force to be reckoned with. Rabbi Moskowitz and I are both honored and proud to share articles on Aish's website. Uh, we're grateful for the opportunity to spread our messages in that way. What brought your family to Israel? It's a big change from, from sort of the entertainment industry in America to becoming observant, but you could have stayed in America, to finding yourself in Israel where your kids don't even have the technology and now mm. at Aish in leadership. So on my first day with my husband, we were set up, I always say matchmaker, matchmaker is not just a summer fiddler on the roof, it's a real job. And we were set up on a blind date by a matchmaker. And on the first date, he said to me, I want to live in Israel. And I said, well, go find yourself another girl because I love Israel, I want to support Israel, I want to visit Israel, but I want to live in Israel. And like water on a rock for about eight, eight and a half years, he really worked on me. That was very much his dream. And I said, okay, he really wants it. He wants something for his spiritual development and for his soul. And I felt like he's not like, you know, I want to work a million hours a day so I can get you a beautiful home with an in-ground pool and a tennis court. He's like, I want to raise our family at, in our homeland in Israel. So I said, I got to give this a shot. So um, I, we went, we came here to Israel and I always say, I, I, had the, I had the luxury of making so many good decisions in my life. I decided to lead a religious lifestyle and to become religious. I decided, you know, to, when I met my husband to marry him and I decided to move to Israel. I wasn't born in to any of these situations. And one of the most incredible decisions of my life, life here also, maybe also Rabbi Moskowitz, what you were speaking about before, life in Israel is also just a little bit simpler, a little bit more real, um, a little bit less, um, saddled down by the baggage of the um, superficiality that really engulfs all of us in so many places. It's a simpler life, and I think it's a great, healthy place to raise a family, um, and it's so unbelievable. And when we came on our pilot trip and we're thinking about coming here, I had remember I was at the Kotel at the Western Wall, and I turned around, and I looked up at the Dan Family Ish World Center, and I had written also for Ish.com with Rabbi Cooper Smith, and I had wanted to meet him, and I just said, like, this would be like an amazing place to work. Like, can you imagine? Like, I worked in Times Square. I worked like, I don't, like this. I was like, I want to come to Israel and work here. And then, you know, ten years later, <laughs> I, I had the opportunity. Not everything happens on our timeline, but I drive into the old city, and I work across from the Western Wall. And the, like my husband, when I leave the house, he says, "Go save the Jewish people today." You know, like I think when that's like your motivation, I think that you're you're always grounded because then you're just praying to God, like, "Please help me connect Jews to their Judaism, Jews to their homeland, Jews to like their our timeless wisdom, our Torah." And like, if that's your driving force, then at that point, that's when I think all avenues, social, digital, used in the right way, are open and available to us if we're spreading truth. So come back to Aish. So tell us a little bit about your position at Aish. Did it exist before you joined Aish? And what, what's your vision? What, where does Aish go next? Aish is a force to be reckoned with. I feel very connected to Aish because I actually served as a madrich on the Discovery Seminar in Yerushalayim wow. one summer after my years in Israel. I came back my first year in YU. Then I went back for a summer. Um, even in my year in Karen Biavna, they were training young people how to do outreach. So a lot of the attitude that we have and the commitment to outreach comes yeah. from the influence of Aish, and Aish yeah. was and is a force to be reckoned with. So yeah. wh when did you join, and why did you join, and what's your vision for where Aish goes next? So uh, all such amazing questions. So about, like I said, it's always was, it always was a dream to parlay whatever I was doing um, with Aish.com into something more. And over the years, I really, thank God, did have a lot of success with seeing the power of digital media and social media, if used for the good, how we could move people. And I thought it was always an amazing outreach tool that was being underutilized. Now, of course, everyone has woken up to it and COVID has accelerated that wake up call, you know, because everyone had to go digital. But it really for many years, was, it, was, it was early. We spoke about being an early adapter. It was not being adapted and or underutilized by the organizations that needed it the most, that could have brought spirituality and kadusha and like, you know, like I said, truth to, to these platforms. And so about two years ago, I saw Rabbi Berg, the CEO of Aish, speak at a Project Inspire Shabbaton. 
And that's when I learned that Aish is a global entity far beyond the Aish New York branch that I went to or the Aish.com that I knew, you know, in the digital space, the scale and globality of the organization. I was like, wow, I didn't realize how, how vast it was and how large it was and how much, you know, they were um, focused for the last 45 years on not just outreach, but like influencing the influencers and influencing, you know, the political echelon all over the world and especially in America and Israel toward Judaism and Jewish causes and, you know, a Torah observant lifestyle. And I said, I want to work for that man. And I, and I really like Rabbi Burr thinks he found me and thinks he created a position for me and that's fine. But I saw him and I was like this, I, I want to do something, you know, in this space. And how do I leverage everything that I know and everything that I learned over the last decade, digital media, social media, branding, marketing, even the last two decades, starting at HBO on, for the sake of the Jewish people. How do I do more with what I have? And so, um, and so this position was created for me. It's really an honor to be a, uh, the first woman in the senior executive leadership team and like everyone I work with is a rabbi which is the coolest thing ever I'm like rabbi 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 it's just like you know it's so inspiring and um and the goal is first from a marketing perspective to rebrand the organization from the top down and that has to do with you know um naming conventions and all the logo and the you know the brand the, the physical brand attributes all across the organization and globally and then also reimagining a digital strategy for reaching three million Jews so that we'll be learning Jewish wisdom over the course of the next 10 years. By 2030, we want 3 million Jews learning Jewish wisdom. Wow. How do you get there? Online. First of all, Online. That answer is, the answer is fantastic. And Rabbi Berg is a dear friend of ours. It's fantastic. Yes. One summer one summer, I was in Israel and I stopped by Aish. I was going to the hotel and I wanted to say hello to him. He wasn't there. So I just sat in his chair in his office and took a picture and sent it to him. And I was like, there's not a lot of things I would leave this for, but that office overlooking the hotel, that yeah. spot, that that's really I was, amazing. I was actually there, there with you at the time. And I didn't think that's you right. were coming home. <laughs> that, was, that was a great moment. That was a great moment. So digitally, great. Digitally Although is, is a broad like answer. The, the biggest growing Jewish community like on the face of the universe. I, it's unbelievable what's going on. Boca there. is good. So we love do, Boca. Boca is like a Israel more. It's a pit stop on the way to Israel. It's a great yes. place to... To, to stop by and, and learn and get geared up to get to Israel. So, how, but how do you do it? Give, I mean, don't, don't give away like the secret sauce or, you know, the recipe of diet of, of Coca-Cola here, but what's the plan? You want to get to 3 million Jews in the next 10 years. So learning. how are we not reaching them now? What, what was Aish not doing? What is Chabad.org not doing? What are every entity that's out there saying there are Jews, affiliated, unaffiliated, secular, religious, not yet religious. They're all over. We want to reach them. What, what's the way that we're going to reach them? Is there a new platform? Is there a new strategy, new marketing? How do we penetrate in there? Well, I really think, first of all, it's leveraging social media correctly and also entertaining. Uh, something I call a hybrid is edutainment. We need to like, you know, it used to be, and I probably even like about a year or two ago, the strategy and the thought process was get them in at the top of the funnel from a digital perspective with entertaining content and then funnel them eventually to learning. Let them land on h.com, chabad.org you know, and, and learn. But we really see that people, even with everything that's going on, on social, they're craving more, even in the short snippets and the micro bites of content that's coming their way. And so there's an opportunity at the top of the funnel to layer our entertaining content with education. And so we're doing a, a whole series of what we call edutainment, micro bites of content at the top of the funnel across every single social platform that matters and bringing them down into h.com and having very specific landing pages we don't want them to just land, you know, like in the, the front of the supermarket. It's like, oh, where do I go to get milk? You know, you can't just like throw them onto the homepage. We need to have them landing on pages that are relevant to the content they saw that brought them in and allow them to go deeper into a vertical that engaged them and intrigued them. And we have, it's like a very quick amount of time we have to do everything. And so it's a lot of testing. You try something, you see what it works, you, you study. Now it's amazing. You can study consumer behavior, user behavior, digital behavior. Where do they bounce? Where do they leave from? What do they look at? What put their eye on the site? It's a lot of psychology connected with digital, you know, marketing as well. And so and it's it's like the melding of entertainment, psychology, and digital consumer behavior to create a consumer journey wow. that will get people. Because now we can, for the first time, reach everyone everywhere. But to get them I'm doing so the right thing. With the thing. Yeah, it's like, I know, it's exciting. It's amazing. Wow. This is the stuff know. I get that gets me excited. <laughs> Is it is it hard or I won't say is it hard? How do you communicate to your children simultaneously? Is it living a dual life? Professionally, you are an influencer. Professionally, you are designing. You're at the cutting edge and the front lines of taking using technology to inspire people. And internally within your own family, you're saying, no, we don't live there. We're not on there. We're not exposed to that. 
how, how do you communicate that message that you're using it professionally and you see its benefit, but personally you're choosing a different direction? Well, first of all, um, I am using it professionally. Um, I do try not to use it socially. Obviously, there's a lot of professional research that has to happen, you know, that I do, but um, that's very, very important. And so I think that that's number one. Um, and they don't see me on it socially. They don't see me hanging out on it. I'm not like the type that's like married to my phone during family time. Like I do keep things separate. I'm right now in my studio and in my office, which is separate from my home. So I think all of that helps create, let's say like a separation between church and state. And that like, you know, that, you know, like a body that, what do we call it? Life work balance, very, very, very important. And I think that has, that was important for me first. And then that trickled down to my kids. Um, and then I think it's, it's timing, everything at the right time, you know? Uh, so this is not the time for them in their high school years and in their formative years to be hanging out on social, what they decide to do professionally to the extent that it has to be incorporated into their careers. If they, you know, based on the path that they choose when they get older, but they'll be old enough there and armed with enough strength and personal awareness and personal confidence to make the right decisions when they see things to know this is for them, this is not for them. But for now, it's more like, you know, it's just not relevant, you know, at, at this stage in our lives. Are, are you in touch with any of the executives from your past professional life who can help you now? You can harness them to achieve these goals with Aish or that life is really left behind? I am in touch with some of the people, you know, um, um, none of them right now from a, from a business development standpoint, those relationships have not blossomed in a way that makes sense. I don't really see the place yet for that to happen, but I'm very much in touch with a lot of the people um, over the years who I've worked with across all industries and uh, networks. Yeah. Okay. So we're 28 minutes into the interview. We've not talked about food yet, despite the fact that I'm not the foodie. So let me, um, <laughs> let me tell you a, a a scenario that may or may not play out in my house every Thursday night, which is that, you know, my wife comes home from work on a late Thursday night. She's tired. She's exhausted. The kids are going bonkers. And then she looks and she goes, is it almost Shabbos again? What am I going to cook this week? So what's your advice? Obviously, people are busier than ever. People have more going on in their lives, raising children, family, obligations, work. And all of a sudden, there's this enormous pressure come Shabbos to not just put out a piece of chicken and a piece of kugel and a piece of challah, but we're having meals. There's en enough cookbooks to fill a library of, yeah. of pressure to make your Shabbos meal something elaborate and extravagant. What is your advice to families who are trying to balance everything, but also with, as, as I said, a healthy dose of balance of not going out of proportion? How do you give people chizuk, despite the fact that you're in that field, of saying it's okay to have a modest Shabbos meal. You don't need to go crazy. You don't need to kill yourself every Thursday night. It's so hard because the whole reason I started this cooking career was to combat that pressure, the tremendous pressure. Either I didn't know how to cook or, or you don't have time to cook, right? Or you're overwhelmed by all the things. That scenario that you just described is like every Jewish woman every Thursday night, including myself. And it's like, you're talking about Shabbos. It's like at dinner time. It's like, oh my gosh, it's dinner time again. Like these kids keep eating, you know? So I wanted to create quick and simple and easy recipes to make preparing for dinner and for Shabbos and for the holidays, like manageable and doable and attainable. And I always said, slavery is so yesterday. It's not about slaving in the kitchen, you know, like we left that behind in Egypt. So, but like with everything, like we spoke about with social media, the cookbook industry just exploded. There are so many, everyone trying to outdo the next person and it, it became a source instead of help, you know, like let's pick a menu, let's be inspired, let's do something. It's like a real source of, like you said, pressure and um, and uh, like just feeling like you, you can't recreate what's on the pages of these books. They're so stunning and so like, like artwork and between the magazines, the weekly come into your home, it's, it's really, really overwhelming. So for me, I, I just don't, like I said before about the same thing you're speaking about being grounded. I do not ascribe to the pressure of the Shabbos meal having to be crazy elaborate. The Shabbos meal is about the family around the table, the Torah that is shared, the relationships, the opportunity to stop and connect. It's not about the food. The food is the means to the end, right? It keeps us around the table. There are certain like wonderful Kabbalistic things that, that are connected to the food. There are certain foods that we have to have. We have to have challah, fish, you know, a, a main course that we usually meet unless you're vegetarian or at a dessert. But I, I'm, I don't ascribe to 35 salads and you know, three mains and a dessert buffet. I also, by the way, if guests bring you joy to your, at your Shabbos table, 
fantastic. Bring them on and just like open the door and like, you know, until there's not a chair left in the house. But if it overwhelms you, even in my own home, we don't have guests every week. Like I find it a great time for family and I feel pressure when guests come. And a lot of people don't like to have me because they feel pressure. So I, so I just feel like you need to do what works for you. And just because you think about Shabbos as a time for entertaining, it can also be a time for, for family. It doesn't have to be pressured and laden with extra guests. And the last thing that I just want to say, supplementing with takeout is also good, by the way. That's very fabulous. And, and the last thing I want to say, I learned this, and I'm sure you, you, the rabbis could probably tell me the source, but I heard you're supposed to do a little something every day for Shabbos to keep Shabbos in mind. And so what I do is like Sunday, I already, you know, set my menu just so I have it. I just put the menu up. So I, I, I have that part done. Tuesday, I make this. Monday, I make the shopping list. Tuesday, I'll shop for the for the non um, produce items, like the non perishables. Um, Wednesday, I will set my Shabbos table. If you're lucky enough to have a separate room with the Shabbos table, we set the Shabbos table on Wednesday. Thursday, I shop for the perishables and, and shop. And then we do the whole thing over again. And so every day, Shabbos is in my mind. It doesn't surprise me. It doesn't creep up. I feel when you have a plan, planning is like allows you to breathe and relax. Can you give us, you must have enormous pressure when you have guests over, like the great Jamie Geller. I'm going to eat at her house. You, you probably feel enormous. like there's enormous pressure. You can't just mail yeah. it in or do something simple or basic. Yeah. Could you get, could you give our listeners um, maybe one or two of simple, the easiest recipes you know for Shabbos? So the person who's not as well planned out as you are or finds themselves in a circumstance that the week didn't go the way they wanted, and now it's Thursday night or Friday, and they need to yeah. throw something together. What's the go to simple, easy recipe? So this recipe was in my first book, and it is to this day one of the most popular recipes I've ever, ever, ever created. It's also gotten a hate mail, by the way. Like I've also got bad reviews on Amazon that say, you call that a recipe? This is not worth the book, the paper that the book is printed on. But duck sauce chicken. A whole chicken cut in eighths, slathered in duck sauce. This is not sponsored. I like Gold's duck sauce. It's just been like around forever. It's really, really, really good. And it's thick enough. I put enough on. You have to put enough on. You throw that in the oven, 375 degrees, about 45 to 50 minutes until golden brown. Everyone loves it. It's chicken and duck sauce. Like, and that's the type of thing that I cook and make. So um, that's like one of my go-to go-tos. Um, I have like a broccoli kugel that's super simple and super easy. Obviously, I'm using the frozen florets. And when my mother-in-law gave me the recipe, she told me to you know, add four eggs, separate the eggs, and beat the whites until they're stiff. So I feel like I did a service to the world by realizing you could just throw everything in the bowl, mix it up. You don't have to beat the whites till they're stiff. Throw it in the oven. And even my mother-in-law says, like at the beginning, now she knows my secret, but she used to say, you make my recipe just like I do, you know? And I didn't beat the egg whites. No, you know, hand mixer required. So a lot of the things where I, I call dump and serve, and I remember I had a publicist who one time said, never use the word dump and cooking in the same sentence. It's not good for you know PR marketing, but everything in one bowl, four or five ingredients. I have a ton of recipes like that. You can do a whole Shabbos meals like that. I have menus on the site on jamiegeller.com, Shabbos in one hour from start to finish, fish to dessert. This is your whole Shabbos meal, cooking, prep, and everything. So these are the types of things I try to make people's lives easier. It's a big chesed. It's a real kindness for the people who struggle. Um, so you used to be on the Food Network. If you were going up against Bobby Flay and you had to beat him, what's your signature dish? Brisket. No one can make brisket like me. I don't even care who. I have the Jewish secrets of brisket from the old country. I wrote the book on brisket. It's called Brisket 101. There's a few techniques. And it's like, I say, you, you don't need no teeth to eat this beef. Melt in your mouth meat. Best brisket ever. He won't be able to do it. Food is so subjective, you know, th these these cooking shows and these judges and these competitions, we're actually having a challenge competition. Rabbi Moskowitz can tell you about our challenge Shabbos that we're hosting. Every drusha, every shir, every class, everything, history, halacha, everything about challenge. And it's going to culminate with a kiddush that's a, that's a challenge contest. So, and there are judges for it. So much of food is subjective, right? When I, when I first got married, I used to love steak well done. I loved it, like burnt, like charcoal <laughs> chard. And my mother-in-law made fun of me. My mother's like, you're abusing yeah. the meat. You don't know what you're doing. Yeah. It's got to still be moving on the plate. And I was one yeah. over. Today, I can't eat it. So today, actually, if I can order, if someone knows how to make it black and blue, I now black like it. Char on the okay. outside, nice and like moving still alive on the inside. But what is there a subjectivity to food? Is it objectively what's Absolutely. good and what's not good? No, no, it's, except for my brisket, everything is subjective. But, yeah. <laughs> no, but seriously, by the way, if you go to a real chef restaurant, they will say we take no responsibility for steaks made over medium. 
comparative or medium. They don't want you know, like they don't want to go there because you're right. It's it's wrong. But if it's good to you, it's good. And I don't care what anyone. It's, it's like saying you know I like turquoise, you like yellow. I like chocolate, you like vanilla. No way. It's completely subjective. There's no wrong way to do it. And that's what one of the things I also say to people like there's no rules in the kitchen. Like that's the coolest part ever. It's a place to do what you do and do what you like and do what your family likes. And I, I love what you just said about the chillin because that's exactly what you're doing offline is exactly what we need to be doing online. We need to grab people. I have a chillin video. I have videos out there that have 110 million views, but we need to take that food video that intrigued all these people, 100 million views, and now pull them into a vertical, right? A digital funnel that allows them to understand chillin, Shabbos, entertain, et cetera, all around because they were intrigued by chillins at the top of the funnel. Right. And that's exactly, you're doing it right. We just need to scale that. That's all that we're doing here. We're not really like, as my mother calls it, discovering America here. This is like, you know, we ain't had a step at the We are just really scaling it on the on the digital side of things. And one of the first things I had to do a bunch of years ago when I first got my first cookbook, I was invited to YU to judge the chilling competition. Oh, yeah. I, I couldn't move for a week after that, by the way. I was like, I, I feel like they put socks in there. Anything that was like in their dorm room, they just put into the chilling pot. It was crazy. What would you tell? What would you tell our contestants? They're getting ready to enter our chilling contest. Jamie Gelly could tell them, here's the secret to a great chilling. What would you tell them? Less is more. People really go mm. with the chilling, like and everything. They go peanut butter, like I said, beer, you know, sweat socks. Like less is more. Good to know. Wow. I'm Rabbi Goldberg, a few quality meat. Rabbi Goldberg, a few months ago, um, blew Cape Cod potato chip stock out of the water when he announced that that was his guilty pleasure food. What is your guilty pleasure go to food? Something cheesy, creamy, pasta y. The, the more butter, the better. <laughs> Anything. Uh, I'll take, like, whether it's manicotti, staff shells, um, parpadelli sauce, a fettuccine alfredo, anything creamy, cheesy, pasta. What's your favorite ingredient okay. to work with? Olive oil. Olive oil. Yeah. What what I is my, I use it on my face, by the way. I, I use it for skincare, I use it for healthcare, everything. For everything. It's good to have olive oil around. Israel, you could go yeah. press your own press your go own ahead. oil. What go what ahead. has changed in cooking since you began? Things that we thought were healthy, now nobody would touch with a 10-foot pole, things we thought nobody would ever eat. Now it's a ingredient. What's changed yeah. in the world of cooking? Well, thank God Israeli food has had its moment. And I really, we pushed up Aliyah for many years because I thought I could never like do my career, my traveling and my everything from here. And worldwide, by the way, like not even kosher, like Israeli food and Middle Eastern food and North African food, it's just like trending. And people like Ashkenazim, like people who are like more bland palates in that Eastern European way of life, like of eating and food, they're even opening up to whether it's Kharif or, you know, Sabih or like, you know, kanafe, like all these Israeli things and Tunisian and North African um, foods, uh, hummus, tahina, tahina is like silam. These are like, everyone's using them. Like like non-Jews are using like tahina and everything. In cooking and baking, sweet and savory. So I love them. I feel like I came at the right time. <laughs> it's perfect. Is it? It's perfect. What are some ways you've had to pivot as an entrepreneur? You're always starting. As you said, you like to be at the beginning of a trend before it uh, is on the upside. What are some misses that you've had? What are some pivots that you've had to make where you say, I'm going to go in this direction and you realize it's not going right. And now you got to pivot to a different direction. Is that hard to do? It's so hard. I've had so many public failures. I, you know, I, I didn't tell the backstory when you said like, you know, how do you keep yourself grounded? I failed so much publicly. That's why I'm saying I don't have that problem. You know, <laughs> like um, I had a very big public magazine at one point and I thought like, you know, I was like, oh, everyone can have a website. You know, same way we said, like anyone with a camera can be an influencer, you know, just open a social media account. I was like, we need to be more, we need to be bigger than we, we need to be better. We need to have a food magazine. This was before like every, you know, weekly Jewish art magazine newspaper had a food section. And we spent a ton of money for many years. And for many years, we kept it going just because of like the embarrassment of like publicly having to close something like that and what that meant, you know, for the brands. And we poured a ton of money into like magazines. You know, we came in a few years before it started dying. And then we, you know, we just like, we couldn't see the writing on the wall and we couldn't let it die. That was like a big public failure. Um, we also tried uh, going into the healthy space, like meal planning, but like healthy meal planning. And even though all the surveys we did over all the years, everyone said they wanted more healthy recipes, but the bottom line is they don't even, for free, they're not even visiting and trafficking those recipes online. And we tried to monetize and do like a healthy meal plan program. And it's like, 
it's still alive now, but it's like puttering. And thank God, not like the magazine it doesn't cost a lot to keep it going, so it, it covers itself. But like we couldn't really get that off the off the ground either. We definitely tried mm. some things out there over the years. I don't want to get you in trouble with anyone, but if if someone, I just booked my flight to Israel. I can't wait. December after Woo! two years of not being there, the longest You're I've come been. Visit, uh, us at H. Absolutely. No question. No question. It's the longest I've gone without being in Israel since my year in Israel. So I can't wait. I'm counting down. I'm so excited. So if you had to recommend a restaurant, I don't want to get you in trouble, but if you had to recommend what is a restaurant in Israel not to miss, what would you say? Flashix, Flashix. Oh, I was going to say, because you know, I like creamy, cheesy, whatever. I'm going to tell you Luciana is the best dairy restaurant. It's in Manila. It's on your way to the hotel. Please, if you can like find it in your heart to just like open up to, like pastas <laughs> and pizzas and everything, definitely go there. For meat, for meat, there's a, you know there's an issue because of kosher certification in Israel. There's lots of like complicated, you know, complicated, lots of complicated. But mahadra, give me a mahadra or a badatz or a, you know. So enter you know. Rodriguez. Those are the two. The problem with them, and they're great, is that they're off the beaten path. They're not like, you know, walkable to the old city. They're not like, you know, they're at the entrance on the one. If they're worth it, we'll find, I don't have to take a camel, a horse. If it's worth it, whatever it takes <laughs> to get there, we'll find a they way. Have parking. They have parking, which is good. They have parking. So enter okay. Cotter Rodriguez and the next door. They're like really close and they're really fantastic. Amazing. This has been a phenomenal conversation. We can't thank you enough for your time. I know you're very busy. You have a lot thank going you. on professionally and personally. You've carved yeah. out time. And I tell you, I don't know, I, the energy that you bring I know Rabbi Moscow, it's a great, like we're just charged to like go change the world with you now. Online, Please. offline, through food, every which way. Really, really brilliant conversation. And we can't thank you enough for spending time with us. You inspired me. You were doing it for, you were the trendsetters. You guys had the advantage. You were ahead of the trend and I'm following the, I'm like jumping on board and being like, yeah, let's do this together. So I'm following you guys. I don't know about that, but we, we will partner. We look forward to doing great things. And I know that's part of Rabbi Berg's vision is using H yes. as an umbrella to take advantage yes. of the many talents around the world and yes. to collaborate in a way, like you said, that funnel. Let's expand the funnel yes. so that yes. we can uh, collaborate together. So we're very Can't excited. Wait. We should talk We should talk about it over a steak in your Yes! Please God. <laughs> Please God. Maybe some pasta. Yeah, I don't know. Ashkenazi stomachs. Uh... Yeah, we'll stick with we'll stick with the steak, but but we thank you very much, and we look forward Amazing. to continuing thank the conversation you. online and thank offline you, right? and getting the message out. Thank you for all you're doing. The Jewish world is so much richer because you found your way to this leadership position in it, and I'm sure HBO and Food Network and Entertainment Weekly are much poorer <laughs> because of it. But it's too bad on them. Grateful for us. Thank you for all that you do. Thank and you. We bless thank you. you. Just continue to do it bigger and better. I mean, I mean, I mean. Thank you so much. It's such an honor. Thank you. Wow. What thoughts? What a conversation. That was a really fantastic conversation. Sophisticated, interesting, strategic, thoughtful, insightful comments about uh, the internet, influencers, social media, strategy for changing the world. Of course, we got to the food and we got to ideas about food and favorite foods. Uh, what jumped out at you by Brody? Well, first of all, while you guys were doing an interview, I was busy in the kitchen with her uh, cookbook over here. <laughs> they put some brisket and wine sauce. I know the secret because I, I have the cookbook. So Secret to the brisket? Yeah, the secret to the brisket. And I'll tell you, they actually got a little bit of a, a, a fight in the family the other day because when my daughter in Israel, when, when Ayala heard that, that Jamie was going to be on, she said, you know, whenever I'm nervous about getting ready for Shabbos, I just turn to Jamie's cookbook and everyone loves everything I make because of Jamie. And Simone said, what do you mean? Don't you have my recipes? So a little contentious over there, but Jamie is apparently the secret uh, secret to the uh, to the Manus family Shabbos. Very thoughtful. You think she'll get there? You think Aish will get there? Three million people by 2030? That's interesting, yeah. yeah. I don't know about you guys. I, my, I'm That's so amazing. excited. The, the energy of how you can use the internet and social media to be able to target people, to be able to get messages out there. You know, I know you well enough and long enough for now, Rabbi Goldberg, that I, I could see your mind racing, even though I couldn't see in your mind. And I could see what's yeah. going to happen at our staff meeting on Monday morning because the two of us are going to come in, the three of us are going to come in, and we're going to have all these ideas now about the scalability of things that you can do and the ability to reach people and to get the messages out there. And even as she was talking, I was thinking of ways, and you know, obviously we're not such a global organization like Aish, but how rabbis and how shuls can utilize a lot of that technology that's out there 
to be able to reach people in a more meaningful and significant way. We're not global. What do you mean? She said it. Asia's <laughs> copying us. BRS global. What are you talking we started. about? started. Yeah. That's what right. are you but I'm just wondering, is, is that meant to be a touch point and then it's going to develop into something because of the relationship, then you're going to get into some serious study? Or is it the idea that if I touch you with a, with a, with a two-minute video, we're done? We're good. No, that's her point. That's her point is that right now it's very shallow. And maybe there's millions of people that you touch in a very shallow way. If you really want to transform lives, you got to get them invested in a deeper way. So how do you get them in that funnel? It's not just, you know, the touch point. It's how do you really get them invested in a much, much well, deeper way? My favorite part of the conversation by far is when she talked about the criteria for following someone online. If you have an Instagram account, if you're still using your dinosaur using whatever Facebook's new name is today, Twitter, what are your criteria for who to follow? What determines who you're willing to invest in their life? And I thought it was really not cliched. It was really insightful. She talked about the people who are online all the time, people who look too carefully curated. Um, and you know all of the advice that right. she gave, I was really impressed by. I love that she said there's so many people that follow people that aren't even people. Like they're just made yeah. up their computers and people have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you something else that that struck me. You know, we always talk about, you know, Robbie Brody, you're the outreach rabbi, and we talk a lot about the numbers in South Palm Beach County and how many we're gonna get to everyone. Outreach by definition is a very hard industry to place metrics and measures on. Like you can test how many people come to an event, right. but it's very hard to measure exactly how effective you are in reaching people. Part of what excited me when she was describing the usage of the internet, social media, to be able to attract people in outreach is that you can really apply metrics and measures towards it, right? You can judge who's coming to your website, how long they're staying on your website. Once they're on your website, what types of classes are they listening to? Are they coming back for more classes? So there's an ability to place metrics and measures on the outreach efforts that you're doing online that are very difficult to do in person. And for me, in terms of professionalizing a lot, the industry, that's a very exciting um, area that you can expand into. So you know what they should be doing then is partnering with every synagogue in the country and saying, you know, allow, uh, uh, use our platform in, to get the word out about what we're doing. So it can kind of you know, come around because right now it's just one organization pushing it out, but imagine they give that to us and we push it out also. You know, what are we doing to to collaborate to make that happen? Yeah, that's the beginning of a conversation. Right, right. There's a lot, lot more to talk about. The other great part of the interview is I happen to be a big duck sauce guy. Put it right <laughs> next to Cape Cod potato chips and Trader Joe's corn chips. I've always loved duck sauce. I'm a big dip in egg roll. You know, when I go to uh, Chosen Island, the five towns, uh, orange beef is phenomenal. But even before it gets there, those uh, fried, what are those things that you dip in the duck sauce? Those noodles? Oh, like the, yeah, the, noodles. the fried noodles. The yeah. fried noodles are just an excuse to eat the duck sauce. Meaning, it, <laughs> yeah, if, if there was a piece of works, challah there. You know, Rabbi Goldberg, if every it, time, every time I think you and I have something in common, you start talking like that, and I just, I, right. I can't even relate. If it, if it were acceptable, I would just put the spoon right in the duck sauce. I'd put right. a straw, I'd put a straw right in the duck sauce, but it's not acceptable. So we have to use the fried noodles just as an excuse to get to that duck sauce. So the chicken with duck sauce. That's maybe I'll maybe I'll offer to make that dish out. There you go. <laughs> duck, duck sauce. <laughs> yeah, for an chicken, hour. No, the chicken. The chicken smothered in duck sauce. How about say to the table Fridays? I like that. She right. said by Wednesday. She said by Wednesday. I'm sorry, I meant by Wednesday. That's I love that very also. The ambitious. image. Every day. Make Every your day. menu, make your shopping list, right. set the table, perishable, non-perishable. Fantastic advice. Whatever happens in my house is the right thing. That's all I know right now. Oh, it is, it is now after you asked her about people getting flustered at work and waking up to the fact that it's Shabbos. You need a couch to sleep on tonight? Uh, nah, no, nah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm so good. Funny. She said that's every – She's think about how relatable she made that scenario right. when she yeah. said that's all of us. So you're it welcome. all of us. Right. Rabbi Masko, it's big bat mitzvah coming up. Will we be hosting? Will we be keeping up the behind the beam of tradition and bringing Shana Masko on? You're going to have to ask the bat mitzvah girl herself. She's a little bit uh, – You'll have to ask her for yourself. Maybe okay. with an invitation from one of the rabbis, she will make an appearance on Behind the Bima. Okay, let's see how well you know your wives, by the way, right now. Rabbi Brody, what's Simone's signature dish? It used to be this apple cranberry thing, and now I'm going to be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Todd, what's your signature dish? <laughs> what, vegan, what vegan dish? Rabbi Moskowitz, let's earn you some points again in your home yeah. tonight. Ooh. What is Rabbi Ariel's signature dish? 
That's a hard oh. one. I just got a text. Just stop talking. But uh, I will say, because this might come as a surprise to some of our listeners, I might be a little bit of a picky eater. I don't eat everything. And my wife happens to be an amazing cook. The challenge is I'm just, I'm very particular in what I eat. Everything I eat, she makes amazing. So whether it's salmon, which I love, I eat salmon like three, four nights a week. She makes a killer salmon. She makes whatever. Tonight, she knew I, we were going to an event. I sometimes uh, get buddy, hungry buddy, before you the might, event. You might as well run for political <laughs> office with that answer. <laughs> Seriously. You might as well run in an election with that answer. That's I mean it. A, what I about you? It. I'm a very picky you're eater, you're, and to her credit, she right. caters around it. Yeah, you're picky eater. That's the understatement of the century. Um, Yechavet has many signature dishes, but something she makes that a lot of people don't know is a tradition from her Oma. She makes a delicious Grinken soup, which is a German shalom for Friday night. It is, Or you can serve a Shabbos day. You can sit overnight. I don't even know what green kern are, but you can't really get them everywhere. Green kern is a type of, I don't know, it's a type of barley or wheat. Yeah, I don't, I don't think the FDA it's a, it's a approved it in America. Green kern soup. It is a delicious soup. And it's always a big winner for whoever's over and eating it. And a nice chilly winter boca night. Nothing like a bowl of green kern soup. Delicious. Delicious I will stuff. say, no, I, just coming back to the conversation, my wife happens to make a fantastic chillant. And everyone, that, I, I'm actually encouraging her to participate. Right no, no, no. <laughs> exactly. Is that what you're reading on your phone? <laughs> I just tell text, them I like, that I made What's your signature dish? Chick- <laughs> what is the signature dish? Unbelievable. Know, what another great trouble, night. You know, there was, a, there was a lot more to talk about. Let's thank our friends Gilly's Goodies again. Email david at gilliesgoodies.com. Subject line BIMA, B-I-M-A. Uh, Gilly's Goodies, subject line BIMA. And you get 10% off. Send that. Send that gift basket. You've got. I remember got there was always stu- like there were always a bunch of kids that would get something sent to them, and then there's a few that I guess the parents didn't know that you could send something, and then they feel left out. So right. yeah, this is so, your opportunity. You could enter a raffle for seventy five dollar value gift basket. Get ten percent off on the gift basket, and the proceeds I know support soldiers, others in Israel. So, Gillies goodies. Make sure to do your part. Want to uh, wish everyone a meaningful Veterans Day. Find a veteran. And say thank you for your service. It'll mean the world to them. It's a big kiddush Hashem. It's the right thing to do. It's an expression of gratitude. And uh, if you're lucky, maybe you'll just get a note from one of us on our Behind the Bima pad. And with it, we will sign off as we do each and every week. Big thank you to Jamie Geller. She's um, she's she's a great story, you know. And um, charismatic, smart, insightful, and had a lot to say. Exciting about, like you said, Rabbi Moskowitz, gave us a lot to think about ourselves and how we embrace the digital platform and the difference that we can make there without compromising our responsibilities offline as well. So another great episode. I'm grateful to our loyal audience. Rate and review. Be entered in a raffle to win BRS swag and merch. Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, and stay holy.